All right, what is up traders? What's up tycoons? Big video today, lots and lots of slides on the deck. All right, uh, we're gonna talk about how recently we just saw the largest outflow ever. We're talking about in history from tech. We'll take a look at market seasonality, go over why this is important and why we're actually following seasonality finally. Um, and then we got to talk about the bull bear beta versus NVIDIA and what that really means, right? So we'll take a look at the chart for NVIDIA and kind of just break down what it means, talk about the consecutive days without an S&P decline of 2%, all right? And then we'll go over many more charts and data in today's video. Uh, we're going to talk about how we're basically approaching the longest run ever um, when it comes to days from the last hike to the first cut, all right? And then the last hike uh, to the first cut. Um, you know, we've been in a very extended inverted yield curve um, that's lasted very, very long. This is one of the longest times. Um, you know, there's some work here from Apollo talking about how stocks are more overvalued than what they were in the tech bubble. All right. Uh, we'll talk about, um, you know, basically the S&P has traded at about 35% uh, of all trading days this year have been an all-time high. Pretty crazy. Um, really good uh, stat here from Carl Quintanilla about Delta Airlines. Uh, I know when people think of the airlines, everybody's just thinking of BA right now in Boeing and the disaster that they're having. Uh, but Delta, all right, is uh, not doing too bad, okay? Um, we'll look at some uh, S&P valuation and earnings measures, and then we'll go over some charts about the uh, dojis and, you know, just the recent performance. Um, Ryan Dietrich is always great. You know, his work at Carson is uh, some of the best. Uh, we'll go over some of his charts. Uh, Josh Browns, um, you know, recently on his podcast, The Compound, was talking about some of his ideas, um, you know, for an ETF. I really like that. So I made those stocks into an ETF. And boy, does that thing look great, right? So we're actually going to look at that. Uh, it'll be really interesting. Um, and then we'll talk about growth versus value. We'll look at a ratio chart of growth versus value. And then we'll take a look at each one individually, right? And then um, I think BMO uh, right here has got some stocks most at risk of a momentum factor unwind. Uh, so we'll take a look at a few names in between here. Um, actually, this is from JP Morgan, not Bank of Montreal. We'll break down a couple of their names uh, and just go over some more data uh, and other things that we're looking at and then give you guys my opinion on the charts there as well. Uh, so it's going to be a really good one. As I mentioned, it is going to be a long one, lots of data. Um, and, you know, I've just been kind of behind. Um, you know, I've been trying to get over this sickness that I've got. I can get better for two, three days, and then it comes right back again. Uh, so it's been tough to, uh, you know, record as much as I want. But there's so much data and things that I want to share with you guys. So we're going to go over all of that in today's video. But as always, remember that the content provided on this channel is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be relied upon as legal, financial, or investment advice. So be sure to read through the disclaimer. And if you're new to the channel, um, I started a newsletter for you guys. It's completely free called Investment Intelligence, giving out free, valuable finance and trading content related to the markets. And I try to sprinkle in a free trade idea in there as well. Uh, in the past two weeks, uh, the newsletter has been writing about the shift in energy. Okay, In this past week that we just experienced, what was the top performing sector? Energy. And what was the worst performing sector? Semiconductors. So, you know, I've kind of been spotting and sniffing out this rotation that we're seeing from semiconductors, possibly into energy. And we'll see if that continues. So, um, you know, I've got some good ones coming up uh, planned out for the newsletter for this upcoming week. And if you guys want to join the Discord, it's only 10 bucks a month. You can get into the Investment Intelligence Discord and get access to all my different analysis, all my different trade ideas. Uh, it's at least 20 plus swing trade ideas every single week. Sometimes I post 20 in a single day. Uh, it really just depends on, you know, me finding some setups. Uh, these are some screenshots from some different profitable plays and trades inside of there. Uh, and these are what some of them look like. You know, um, we highlighted a falling wedge and a cup and handle here. Uh, that was a really nice trade. Um, Intel, you know, I'll try to spot and point out um, things that I see. You know, there's a $1.5 million order block for shares at $43 which was right at this key zone we had tested about five times, and then it was below $43. So that seemed like a pretty good opportunity. Uh, that turned into a really good play. But let's go ahead and get into the video and talk about how we've seen the largest outflow ever from tech, okay? And while this seems very extreme, one thing that I do want people to consider is that think of how much larger the market cap of all of these tech stocks are, okay? Okay. They're much larger than what they were 10 years ago, even five years ago, okay? So 
when you think about some of these stocks having a 10%, 5%, 15%, 20% correction, it is a lot more money flowing out of these stocks than it was 5, 10, 20 years ago. Okay. But either way, it is still very, um, you know, compelling data and just showing you guys that, hey, you know, we're seeing a lot of outflows from tech. Uh, this past week, you know, we saw, um, you know, some of the results of that. Uh, you know, some of these tech stocks and some of these semiconductor stocks weren't really able to catch a bid this past week. We'll see if that continues. All right. Um, you know, it's too, really too hard to count the bulls out right now uh, because they've just been buying up any of these dips that they can. Uh, but we'll just dive into things a little bit further. And when you look at March market performance for seasonality, um, you have this period here, the dotted lines. This is going to be where we're currently at. And then the end here is going to be the typical, uh, you know, March seasonality performance. And you typically start to see the beginning of the month is really choppy. And we put in a low typically in the first half of the month. And then the second half of the month of March, we actually start to rally. So we'll see. That's something definitely to consider with, you know, some of the pullbacks we've seen in stocks like Apple, um, you know, for instance, has been dropping a lot here recently, uh, trying to recover a little bit, but definitely down a lot. Now, when you look at the index bull bear uh, beta versus NVIDIA, Basically, what you're looking at here, if this is like, you know, tough for you to read or understand, is that the market in the indexes, so let's say the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100, all right, they are very susceptible to negative moves in NVIDIA, okay? When you take a look at the NVIDIA bear beta, it's at 0.35. The bull beta is only at 0.17. The S&P 500 is at 0.22, the Russell 3000 0.22, and then you take a look at small caps and mid caps and everything else. Um, there's lots of bearish beta related to NVIDIA, okay? Um, so, you know, NVIDIA is really the one stock that rules them all right now, all right? If, if NVIDIA is performing well, uh, it's going to help the market out a little bit, okay? It doesn't mean necessarily that the market has to rage just because NVIDIA is going up. But if NVIDIA is going down and we're starting to see red moves in NVIDIA, um, that is that is going to impact and it's going to have a large impact on the market. Now, it may not cause a market crash. We may have other sectors rallying and trying to uh, help hold some of the weight. But still, um, there is a very large beta aspect um, when it comes to NVIDIA, right? And when you look at the chart here, okay, this isn't um, some you know crazy trend line that's been tested a million times. Uh, it's very hard to find a multi-tested trend line here, but if you take the lows right before its earnings uh, gap up, right, and you connect it to the lows there, the lows there, and the lows here, you see we broke through there, retested it. Okay, we broke through, retested that zone, and we got a bearish crossover on the MACD. Now there hasn't been much follow through anytime we've gotten a bearish crossover, right? The most bear recent bearish crossover was over here, and yeah, Nvidia dropped about you know 50 points, maybe something like that. Uh, which seems like, you know, the end of the world. And then what did it do? Well, you know, it basically just went up another two, three hundred dollars right after that. So, you know, uh, just some things to consider, right? A little bit of a bearish divergence, a bearish crossover. We know uh, now you guys know that how much uh, bear beta there is to the indexes uh, for, you know, or from NVIDIA. So it's definitely going to be something to monitor, right? I mean, if we stay below this trend line, right, it's very possible we can head back to 735. There's even a small little gap down here to fill from earnings around 692.58, okay? Um, so, you know, just watch out for that, okay? Be prepared, keep an eye on it. You know, if we break through 840, uh, it's very likely we're gonna come down to some of these levels, right? Now, this is the current market mentality. NVIDIA stock is up, S&P 500 goes to new all-time high. If NVIDIA stock is flat, the S&P 500 goes to new all-time high. And if NVIDIA stock is down, S&P 500 falls just 30 points. Yesterday, uh, and this was last week, uh, NVIDIA marked its largest percentage drop since May 31st. And it also marked the so single largest loss of market cap in a day for NVIDIA, which was about a $128 billion. Yet the S&P 500 only fell 30 points after a 27% run in four months. Since NVIDIA bottomed on October 27th, the S&P 500 uh, was up exactly 1,000 points. Is this the most resilient market of all time? And that's kind of just hinting at what I was saying earlier that, hey, you know, it's very tough to count the bulls out, you know, just because of a bearish day or two or even a bearish week. Um, you know, the bulls have been very resilient. This market has been very resilient. And, you know, even if we do get uh, some more pullback in the market, 
at the end of the day, I think that the bull market is going to continue. I've made several videos going over the uh, historical data suggesting uh, that, you know, we basically have anywhere from 80 to 100 percent odds of getting about a 13 to 20 percent rally in the market this year. So, um, you know, we're we're quite not, we're not quite there yet. Uh, we may be in the middle or just the very beginning of a correction in the market. Uh, but, you know, as I mentioned before, it's been very, very tough to, you know, flip completely bearish and count the bulls out. Now, when you look at the consecutive days, all right, of trading without an S&P 500 decline of 2%, uh, we're approaching all-time highs here, okay? We're over 250 days in the stock market. Um, you know, the all-time high for that is 350. We'll see if we get there. We'll see if we get a 2% correction, uh, but, you know, this is something that um, is not necessarily sustainable, okay, is basically all we're getting at is there's no way that that's really sustainable. Um, you know, this is the second highest on the chart. Yeah, I can keep going up uh, just because, you know, it's the second highest doesn't mean that I can't go higher or potentially even go higher than this. Uh, but when you if you were to take an average or a mean here, uh, it would be much, much lower. All right. And, and we are very overextended right now. And Matt Weller over here is talking about the NASDAQ 100 looking sketchy ahead of the weekend as Microsoft was down negative 2.4% weighing on the tech heavy index. A break of 17.8, um, you know, thousand in the NDX points to deeper retracement towards the low 17 uh, thousands. All right. So he mentioned Microsoft. Let's go ahead and take a look at Microsoft. And uh, there is a little bit of some bearish divergence. If you're not familiar with that term, I'll break it down and explain it to you very easily and quickly in one second. So notice how we have highs, lower highs, right? High, lower high. Okay. Then we take a look at those same exact points on the chart. We have highs and then we have higher highs. So we have a high and a higher high on the price action. We have a high and a lower high on the RSI, which is your relative strength indicator. And this is telling us that we're losing relative strength, even though price is going higher. It's a term known as bearish divergence and indicates that, hey, you may see some type of bearish activity in the future. Um, not only that, we did come out and we hit the, our bullish price targets, which is basically 420 on Microsoft. And so, um, you know, my stance on Microsoft for the time being is going to be below 420. Uh, I think we can come back down and retest this, uh, you know, 395 to about 400 region. Okay. That's an area where, you know, it was uh, a little bit of resistance over here, right? We saw a little bit of resistance here and we saw some support, support, support again. Uh, so I think we, you know, it makes sense if we were to come back down and, and, and retest that area. Now, the question there is, do we bounce higher after we come down and retest that area? Or do we, you know, break retest and push lower down to a previous price target of about 385? Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's what I'm watching when it comes to Microsoft right now. Now, um, these are just some different rate hike cycles. OK, the average days from the last hike to the first cut is 105. OK, we are currently sitting at 236. This is the second most extended. OK, um, and this is pricing it in basically in June. All right. Because the market currently is pricing in June. Rate cuts uh, is where we'll get our first rate cut. I would put it at 236 days. Um, if we don't get it in June, then it's possible we may not really even get rate cuts until the end of the year, possibly even till 2025, okay? Uh, and that would extend it even closer to um, the highest period here, which is 319 days. Now, this is something that you kind of want to last longer, okay? And I'll break it down for you guys really quickly. Uh, but the return in the market from the last hike to the first cut, you know, the shorter this time period is, the 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 returns aren't really great. OK, but as you start to build more time behind that, the returns get better. OK, and a rate cut, you know, a lot of people are wanting rate cuts right now, but historically it's a bearish moment. OK, because oftentimes the Fed is only cutting rates when something is broken in the economy. OK, and if something's broken in the economy, it's very likely that we're heading towards a recession, if not already in a recession. And so if you get in that period from the days from the last hike to the first rate cut, the longer you can extend that, uh, the longer the, the chance that you have of our extending gains. It's not a coincidence that the, you know, the longest streak here also had the most impressive gains. Then you take a look at some of the other ones. OK, because these are all really short periods, did not have impressive gains. Right. All of them less than two, three months. Uh, but when you come here. 
If you take a look at 112 days, we've got 19% returns. 319 days, you got 22% returns. 162 days, you got 19% returns. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, you know, you really do just kind of want this to extend uh, as long as possible, all right, in a sense that, you know, typically Fed rate cuts are not good for the stock market. Now, stocks are more overvalued today than the 1990s tech bubble. Now, this is from Apollo. I don't necessarily know if I agree with this. It's a little bit of check cherry picking, uh, but we'll go over the data that they're specifically covering. And so the first thing I want to highlight is the green bars here. These are all going to be uh, the 1990s bubble. Okay. And so there's a few periods here, right? If you look at this one, okay. And this one, and this one, this one, you know, basically everything under 15, this is where you start to see um, that the distribution of PE ratios, um, you know, in 2024 is actually larger. Okay. Um, but to me, this is more of a sign of market breadth. All right. Um, you know, People are saying in 2023 that, hey, it was only seven stocks and those seven stocks are in a magnificent seven bubble and that bubble is going to pop, right? Well, you know, what we're seeing here is that, hey, you know, if, if this is the percentage of stocks, okay, um, and, and we're seeing that it goes all the way down to like 65%, uh, you know, are, are trading uh, at elevated PE ratios compared to the 1990s tech bubble. Well, this is telling me that it's, you know, it's not just seven stocks that, uh, you know, are in a big price, right? Now we'll break down their exact tweet real quick. So Apollo just doubled down on their view that we're in a bigger bubble than the 2000.com bubble. Three weeks ago, they said the current bubble is bigger than the 1990s tech bubble. They know that the forward PE ratio for the top 10 stocks right now is around 40% uh, or is around 40 times compared to 2000 at the peak of the dot-com bubble. The forward PE on the top 10 stocks um, was around 26. Now, Apollo says that, Roughly 30% of stocks have a P.E. ratio of 30 times or more. Overall, Apollo says that P.E. ratios now are much higher than they were in 2000. And so what's next for the AI hype? Right. Um, now, Ben Carlson had a pretty good tweet. He's also from the compound. Uh, the S&P 500 has now hit new all-time highs on 35% of all of its trading days this year. Seems pretty high. Uh, and then someone retweeted him that this was the fourth best start to a year ever in S&P 500, um, you know, showing the percentage of days closing at a record high trading uh, through day number 46. Now, uh, Carl Quintanilla has this tweet about De Delta Airlines saying that the CEO said uh, they've had nine of their top 10 sales days in all of history, all within the last 10 weeks. Uh, that's very bullish. OK, that, um, you know, that's good. That's good for them. Uh, and, you know, it's nice to see that amid all of this really bad news going on with BA. And when we take a look at the charts, you know, I posted this one in the Discord previously. Uh, and, and you know, we're looking at this key zone, right? And we're saying, hey, above this key zone here, we're going to be targeting this 44 area. You can see we came up to that area. We actually pulled back and retested this level. But we're still trading in a kind of a bullish channel. So, you know, really until we break about 42.50 or we break this trend line here, um, you know, I think we can come back and retest 4030. Um, but until we do that, you know, I'm pretty much going to be bullish on this, right? And above 44, the next price target here is 4667. Okay, so that's what I'm watching right now when it comes to Delta Airline, you know, break of trend or a break of 4250 area. Uh, that's going to be something to be concerned about and, and be cautious of uh, for a potential move lower. Okay, uh, so that's it for Delta. Uh, S&P 500 valuation and earnings measures, uh, yes, they have gone up, but they're nowhere near 2021 highs or the 2000 highs. This is the average Z-score of price to earnings, uh, PE, uh, you know, price to book, um, price to sales, different things like that. Okay, this is a valuation composite from BMO. And, you know, yes, as I mentioned, while things are elevated, um, they're not as frothy as they were in, you know, different time periods in the past that we've had. Uh, this just suggests that, hey, if if we do want to keep running up and melting up, because the market really just seems to be melting up, um, you know, then then we still have a little bit to go before we're extremely frothy, right? And we can even draw a trend line here, okay? I mean, not to do technical analysis on, on valuations and PE, but, you know, take a look at that trend line right there, right? I mean, uh, does this look like it's ready to break out or break down, in your opinion? 
uh, to me, it kind of looks like it's ready to break out. So we'll see how, you know, it ultimately it, uh, it plays out. Uh, Spy just printed two weekly doji candlesticks. OK, these doji candlesticks are often, uh, you know, they're known for being indecision candlesticks and often being, um, you know, signs of a shift uh, in, in trend. Right. Or some type of reversal, whether it's a bearish or bullish reversal. And now we've gotten two of them. Uh, so the bears are going to tell you that, hey, this is going to lead to the spy coming back down to 505, 500, you know, 490, some of those key levels. Uh, we'll have to see if if buyers and sellers are really just confused uh, and, and we continue to shop around or if we get to uh, see some strong momentum to the upside or to the downside uh, within this next week. Now, <clears throat> this is from Nautilus Research. SPX Doji denotes indecision. Right, a, a weekly doji when SPX is over 10% above its six-month moving average. This is the first time in a year. Um, historically, weeklies, uh, weekly dojis that form when the high is at least at a 52-week high and the aspects extended above its six-month moving average reveal a market that finally may be revealing some indecision slash exhaustion. Okay, Basically just suggesting that, hey, it could be time uh, for things to cool off here right now a doji pattern candlestick chart typically signifies indecision in the market characterized by a small body with wicks on both ends indicating that the opening and closing prices were very close together now if you look at the average after the signals um you know typically uh you know you're looking at anywhere from negative four to about negative seven negative seven percent returns okay uh so it's not something to be bearish for the entire year or or make you say that hey you know, the bull market is over, but it does suggest that, hey, we could be in the middle of getting a pullback. Now, the S&P 500 has gone 96 trading days without experience, even a 2% pullback. Uh, this is from Bespoke. You see this nice little bull, uh, bullish channel that they've got. Um, but Ryan Dietrich points out that S&P 500 was up 24% the past 20 weeks, uh, and he was able to find 22 other times where it was up 20% or more in 20 weeks. Um, and one year later, it was higher 21 times. So 21 out of the 22 times, uh, the 12 month returns were anywhere from uh, about 12 to 13 percent. Uh, that was your average and median scores. So that's good. I mean, that looks good to me. And this is um, just more stuff of what I was suggesting. When you take a look at some of these numbers and data, it's really hard to suggest that, you know, the market is going to go through a complete crash and not finish the year higher than where we're at right now right or higher than the previous all-time highs that we just made now it's perhaps not a stretch to say year three of post rate liftoff might be more challenging than prior years the s p 500 sits in the top decile of the 12 month percentage change versus the first decile one year ago but keep perspective a two a two year percentage change shows stocks are only slightly above average performance right and so this is your rolling two-year percent change and you can see this is why he was saying uh keep perspective right and this is why multiple time frame analysis is so important because you're seeing maybe something suggesting that we're topping out or overbought on a smaller time frame but when you go to a larger time frame um you're seeing that hey it's really only slightly above average performance uh, now this is the josh brown etf OK, uh, he kind of joked around about how he should make this an ETF, but it's really just focused on companies that have been able to have 25 uh, percent revenue growth or more, uh, you know, over the past five years. Uh, and this is going to be annualized growth. Um, and, you know, the stocks that come up in this scan, uh, you know, along with, you know, all the other criteria they have is going to be AMD, Uber. I really like Uber. I wish I got back into that one uh, at much, much cheaper prices, but you know, we don't have time machines. Palantir's, um, you know, a retail stock favorite. This is one that I like as well. Uh, there's Team. Not too many people know about Team or Pfizer uh, or maybe even ServiceNow. Um, you know, those are some interesting ones that you guys can check out. And then Crowd CrowdStrike is really, really nice there uh, as well. I think that company's got a lot of potential in the you know coming years in the future. You know, we combine all of those stocks together into one ETF or into one, you know, ticker, one candle chart. Uh, this is what you get. And this is a huge, huge base right here, guys. I mean, this looks freaking juicy. Now, does it look like it's ready to break out right now? No, okay? Uh, in fact, I would rather prefer to see a cup and handle, you know, type of deal form here, right? Where we get a little bit of pullback consolidation and then we break out. Uh, that would be lovely for me, right? And at this point, I would probably equal weight all of these stocks, um, you know, just to kind of test it out and test this theory out. 
um, you know, and, and, you know, since you can't actually create this ETF and it's not there for you, um, you know, you can equal weight it and, you know, using something like Robinhood, for instance, which lets you just buy dollar amounts of a stock. So you can put a hundred dollars in all of these names. You can put a thousand dollars in all of these names. Um, that's something that I'm pretty much going to try and experiment with. Uh, if we can break about, uh, break out above these highs right here, 1779, um, or if we get a nice little decent pullback here and start to put it in the bottom for a handle to our nice cup, uh, that also is going to be a juicy opportunity. Now, growth style continues to enjoy strong earnings momentum this year while value flatlines. Um, and so what I've got right here for you guys, I've showed it before in the past, but this is a ratio chart of SPY G divided by SPY V. So, you know, when this chart goes up, it means that growth is outperforming value. Uh, this is typically what you're going to see in a bull market and in bull market cycles, right? You see in a bull market, you see um, uh, SPY G, you're seeing growth outperforming value. And over here, you know, we've actually, we're in this bear market, okay, in 2022. And this is where we saw growth underperforming value and value outperforming growth. Uh, and recently, of course, you know, uh, at the beginning of 2023, uh, this actually bottomed out and we started an uptrend and we have officially come back into a bull market in the stock market. Um, here's Spy G. It looks very similar to that uh, initial chart that we were just looking at. Um, you know, not too interested in trying to buy the highs up here. I uh, do want to be cautious of a pullback uh, or a break of this yellow trend line here. Uh, but if this can break out above 73.55, I think you can use that, target that as some longs, uh, and then put a stop loss at 72 or 72.50, something like that. Um, and, and, you know, there's a nice little trade set up there. But SPY V looks really good, okay? Um, of course, on a percentage-wise performance, it's not outperforming uh, SPY G, the growth sector, but value stocks have been doing very well here also, okay? They they bottomed as well in October of 2022. Uh, and it's been a very, very powerful move that they've had ever since October of 2023. Um, value has been performing extremely well. Now, the stocks that are most at risk of a momentum factor unwind, um, you know, you guys can screenshot this. There's names like NVIDIA, Lilly, Meta, Avigo, AMD, CRM, Amazon, Adobe, Netflix, Microsoft, Costco, right? These are just some of the names on this list. Um, you know, the first one we're going to take a look at here is Lilly, Eli Lilly. Uh, this stock has been going parabolic. It looks like it's NVIDIA or something. Uh, but below 763, I think this can head lower and we can come back down to retest this 730, 725 area. And ultimately, if we break through there... Uh, I think we're going for the gap fill down here at 673.15. There's already been a bearish crossover on the MACD. There's already been bearish uh, divergence here on the RSI. We just haven't really seen any follow through uh, with it breaking its key level of support here. Now, Meta is another stock that's been going absolutely parabolic. You can see this huge parabolic run and curve here. Are we potentially about to break out, break down out of this parabolic curve? It's definitely something to consider. Now, these are the rest of those names from JP Morgan. Uh, and so we're going to, you know, you can screenshot this real quick. So that way you guys can take a look at some of these names. Um, but when we look at one of them in here, which is ABBV, right? ABBV has been very bullish, right? You see bull flag setup, bull flag consolidation, breakout, bull flag consolidation, breakout. And here, again, I'm not ready to really count the bulls out of the picture. But if we break below 176, um, then, you know, I think you, it's possible to target 172 slash 168 to the downside. You know, those are going to be some areas where I think you could find some support with the old resistance becoming new support. Uh, there's bearish divergence and a bearish MACD crossover here as well. Uh, anytime you've seen these bearish divergences on AbbVie, uh, they've typically led to significant pullbacks like the one we saw here and the one we saw over here. Uh, this also led to a significant pullback. Now, the chart below features uh, the 2024 cycle composite for the NASDAQ. Uh, and while they view cycle composites as secondary inputs, this is particularly interesting given the current market environment. And so what they're suggesting, okay, uh, is that, hey, you know, things have been trending pretty uh, fair with the actual NASDAQ composite. It's going to be this yellow dotted line. Uh, but they're suggesting we're going to see a pretty strong pullback here, right? And and, and see a, a strong decline in this NASDAQ cycle composite chart. Uh, now, the NAAIM has moved up above 100% again. Active investment managers becoming now super bullish after two hot inflation prints and ahead of next week's FOMC meeting. Very strange. 
right? Usually this is when you start to see times of caution. Uh, maybe they know something or, or you know, or, or putting a large bet on uh, predicting, you know, how the FOMC meeting is going to go. Um, but it is pretty strange, right? And oftentimes when you come up to these levels, these can end up making uh, market tops, right? As noted on this chart, when you see here, here, and here. Now, materials, financials, and energy all coming into previous highs. Where do we go from here? Well, I've dropped two videos on these specific subjects, right? I've dropped a video on basic materials, and I've dropped a video on energy here recently. Um, after this video, most likely I'm going to dive into financials, but you know, there's a uh, equal, there's an equities for rising rates ETF. Okay. What this means is this is basically a basket of stocks that if you think interest rates are going to go higher, treasury yields are going to go higher. Uh, these are potentially some good names to own. Uh, and that one is breaking out and it's largely composed of materials, financials, and energy pretty much make up that entire portfolio. Uh, so if all three of these are going to break out uh, and we continue to see a rotation out of tech, you know, that could just be another sign of the market telling us, hey, uh, you know, we're not really anticipating getting as many rate cuts as we were. Uh, and they're repricing in some things uh, and diversifying into some of these different sectors that aren't so interest rate sensitive. Now, large cap energy stocks broke out of their year to date relative price range this week as inflation prints roiled the market. Historically, the shares in crude oil moved closely in tandem and stocks may be overdue to catch up with the commodity. So, um, you know, we'll see how this goes, uh, but this is basically, you know, suggesting that, hey, you know, something like XLE still has some more room to run. We recently saw USO breakout and hold the breakout. So that was a nice little bullish sign for us as well. And then when you see copper and emerging markets, there, um, you know, Christian right here is saying that it's going to be interesting to see if the uh, emerging markets can follow through. And I try to make a little bit of a cleaner chart for you guys. So uh, this is the EEM right here. And then this is copper futures. You can see copper futures already broke out from its previous highs over here. Um, and, you know, EEM still has not. So there is some good uh, opportunity for gains here uh, in emerging markets or the EEM ETF. Um, if copper is going to continue being a leading signal for this, uh, then we could actually start to see this one break out. So pay close attention to that. Uh, this is copper itself right here. Um, really, really strong parabolic move, not super parabolic, but very strong aggressive move uh, after the breakout retest of the previous FIB levels. And now we're up here at the 618 FIB level, which is 4.0365. Okay, so above 4.0365, uh, I think copper can continue to head higher and below there. Uh, well, this could have been a little bit of a false breakout. Now, this is EEM. This chart looks really, really good, honestly, right? Um, I mean, we talk about the more times you test a level, the weaker it's going to get. And we tested it one, two, three, four, five times now. If we were to come up and retest this area again, I definitely think we can break out and head up to 4297. Uh, but above 4297, you're basically going to be targeting 46 to 47, right? There's a little bit of shelf, price shelf over here. Uh, and then from there, you'd be looking at 4882, right? So those are some of the key things I'm watching uh, in the emerging markets. Now, we talked about the possibility of rising rates, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, there's a chart here from Alfonso uh, talking about how, uh, you know, basically what he's suggesting is that he thinks that yields are can go higher and will go higher and come back up to this 4.35% area, which we're really not very far away from there as all. And it's been resistance many times in the past, uh, and we'll have to see if we reject that zone again or if we continue to head up higher. Now, this is from Frank Capillary talking about MSOS. Uh, this is a pure cannabis ETF. And, you know, I really don't like how some of these people I've noticed will use different charts uh, just to try and make their chart look cleaner, right? Like this guy's, you know, changed it from a bar chart and then he changed it to a logarithmic chart. You know, maybe he always uses bar charts that are logarithmic. Um, but, you know, whenever I look at it and I just flip it simply to a bar chart, you know, this is what it looks like here. Um, and then you have to turn on logarithmic, right? So uh, this is a bar logarithmic chart right here. This is just the regular candlesticks, okay? And it looks much different, right? Um, but what I do like is it appears we're starting to build a base here. We've got a key support zone over here. We've got some prior demand that turned into new supply. Um, but on 
off of the breakout and retest of this trend line here, I do think we can potentially push higher and break out above this $10 level, right? And above $10, we're really going to be targeting $12.50 to about $15. So uh, some nice potential there uh, in this play uh, if we end up seeing some follow through. Now, Disney stock is up 80% relative to Tesla following Elon's choice words for CEO Bob Iger. Uh, this is when Elon Musk basically told Disney, uh, when he told Bob, he was like, yeah, Bob, he's like, go F yourself, right? Um, and, you know, that was all, all obviously a boss moment and everybody was like, oh, man, Elon's so cool for that. But uh, Wall Street does not seem to have liked that, okay? They've been pumping Disney stock. Uh, and selling the crap out of Tesla ever since then. And, you know, here's a really good way to visualize it. You know, the, the highs, uh, Tesla is down, you know, 38% from its recent highs. Meanwhile, Disney is up like 27% from its recent lows. So very big difference uh, in the way those companies have been performing. Now, this is Disney's chart on the daily. Um, you know, I'm watching to see how this resolves a year, you know, above 108, I think Disney can still be bullish and head higher. Uh, there's a gap fill up here at 119, uh, but below 108.30, there's a huge gap down to fill at 99.50. And I think that that's very possible and very likely to happen. Now, when you look at S&P 500 record highs and drawdowns by year, uh, this chart goes backwards a little bit, right? So 08 is over here. Um, 2024 is right over here. All right. And the orange is going to be your max drawdown, okay? Um, and then the blue here is going to be the number of S&P 500 record highs. And we have, you know, approached 20 S&P 500 record highs, okay? Which the average is about 17 um, for, you know, uh, the number of new highs is right around 17.5. And uh, we're pretty much there and we're approaching 20. So this is going to be, um, you know, being that this is still only the first quarter of the year, uh, it's got lots of potential, right? If we keep up this bullishness to make a lot of history and really see a significant push higher. Um, now, <clears throat> this is from uh, Bespoke right here. Now, they like to measure overbought and oversold levels as a closing price that is one or more standard deviations uh, from the 50-day moving average. And so by that measure, the S&P 500 closed at overbought levels for 40 straight days through the close on March 14th. While that sounds extreme, they would know in the period ending on August 1st of last year, the S&P 500 closed at overbought levels for 45 straight days in what was the summer, quote unquote, of overbought. Now, consecutive days of overbought readings. While the S&P 500 has been overbought for the last 40 trading days, not a single sector has closed at overbought levels for as many days. As shown in the chart, the streak for the financial sector has been close at 39, followed by industrials at 30 days. After those two sectors, no other sector has closed at overbought levels or even half as long as the S&P. To put that in perspective, since the daily sector price data starts in late 1989, there have been 11 other periods where the S&P closed at overbought levels for at least 40 trading days. And one of those periods, there was only one in 2012 in which it was not a single sector had seen 40 or more overbought straight closes on the same day that the S&P 500 reached 40. Now that's going to wrap up the video. I know it was a little bit of a longer one, but you know I had a lot of charts and data I wanted to show with you guys. But don't forget to sign up for the Discord. The link is in the description down below. Uh, that's $10 a month, or you can sign up for the newsletter. Uh, that is completely free. Uh, you can get those sent directly to your inbox, or you can just monitor the website, however you'd like to access the information. And if you enjoyed today's video and you guys uh, enjoy the way I do some of my analysis, you want to go over some day trading strategies, swing trading strategies, or maybe you have some questions you want answers to, uh, you can go to my Ko-Fi page. There's a link in the description for that as well. Click on the commissions tab, and in there, uh, you can book a 30-minute or a one-hour session. Appreciate you guys watching. Smash the like button, subscribe to the channel for more. And if you enjoyed today's video, most likely you're going to enjoy this next video right here. Uh, so be sure to click on that one.